In this lesson, we're going to break down competing claims to title at both the common law and under Recording Act statutes, which have been adopted in all 50 states. All right, so the main idea here, big picture, right? what we're dealing with is a situation where the grantor conveys title and property to multiple grantees, right? Say that on Monday, right, our owner of Greenacre conveys fee simple absolute to Amy, right, executes a deed. Now, Amy has a deed that says she's the rightful owner of Greenacre. We'll say the very next day on Tuesday, our grantor conveys fee simple absolute in Greenacre to Bobby executes a valid deed. Now Bobby has a deed that says he's the rightful owner of Greenacre, right? So of course, what's going to happen here? We're gonna have a competing claim of title. Amy and Bobby both can't be the rightful owners of Greenacre in fee simple absolute at the same time. Only one of them can prevail. Only one claim to title will prevail. So if we see a situation where we have a grantor transferring right title, the same title and land to multiple grantees, right, we're going to have competing claims to title. The question is who is the rightful owner? Whose claim to title will prevail? Well, at common law, this was really easy, right? At common law, if a grantor transferred the same title and land to multiple grantees, the grantee's deed who does, who's delivered first prevails. Basically, whoever had their deed delivered to them first is going to prevail. You can think of this as first in time, first in right, right? So if Amy had her deed delivered to her on Monday and Bobby had his deed delivered to him on Tuesday, Amy wins, right? We don't care about any of these other facts. It doesn't matter whether Amy had notice or didn't have notice, whether Amy purchased for value or whether Amy was given Greenacre as a gift. We'll see all of this today in jurisdictions that have adopted Recording Act statutes, which is all 50 jurisdictions, right? All 50 states have adopted different Recording Act statutes. We'll see that whether or not subsequent purchasers have notice, right? Whether or not purchases are made for value or not for value, whether or not deeds are recorded or not recorded, all of this can be really important in the analysis of whose competing claim to title wins. But at common law, we ignore all of that stuff, right? It's just whose deed was delivered first. That party prevails. Very easy, so don't get tripped up. If you see on a real property fact pattern, competing claims to title, and you're asked to apply the common law approach, right? don't get tripped up by all this stuff we're gonna talk about. Literally, whose deed was delivered first, that's who wins. We can ignore basically all of the other facts. It's just whose deed was delivered first. So if Bobby's deed was delivered on Tuesday and Amy's deed delivered on Wednesday, then Bobby wins. Even if Bobby knew about the transfer from Amy or from the owner to Amy, doesn't matter, right? If Bobby's deed was delivered on Tuesday and Amy's deed was delivered on Wednesday, Bobby wins at common law. His claim to title prevails over Amy's. So the common law approach is really easy. Unfortunately, right, the common law approach has been abandoned in all 50 states and we're going to end up with a little bit more complicated analyses than the common law approach in all 50 states today, right? All 50 states have adopted a recording act statute that modifies the common law rule for competing claims to title. And in most jurisdictions that have adopted these competing claim to title recording act statutes, right? It really turns on this idea of notice, whether the subsequent purchaser had notice of the prior interest. The idea being, was this a good faith innocent purchaser or not, right? Because if they purchased without notice, right? They didn't have any of these different types of notice we're gonna talk about. They didn't have actual notice. They didn't have record notice. They didn't have inquiry notice. This is truly a good faith purchaser who purchased this property for value, right? We might want to give them some protections, right? Because they're an innocent subsequent purchaser if they didn't have any knowledge of the prior interest and they're purchasing for value. We'll see in most states, right? Those states who have adopted right, the notice jurisdiction states and race notice jurisdiction states want to provide some sort of protection to those, you know, quote unquote, innocent purchasers, people, subsequent purchasers, right, who had no knowledge of the prior interests right, or didn't have notice of the prior conveyance, right? 
So before we really break down how it plays out in different jurisdictions, we have to understand, well, what is this concept of notice? Because everything kind of hinges on whether the subsequent purchaser had notice of the prior interest or not. And we'll see there's really three types of notice. We have actual notice, record notice, and inquiry notice. Right, we can start with actual notice. A subsequent purchaser has actual notice when he or she has personal knowledge of the prior interest. Right, this is really straightforward. Did the subsequent purchaser have actual personal knowledge of the prior interest or not? Right, so in our example, imagine that on Monday, our owner of Greenacre conveys Greenacre to Amy, and then on Tuesday, he calls Bobby up and says, hey, I just conveyed Greenacre to Amy yesterday for this much money, but I'll convey it to you today for this much money. And Bobby accepts and he purchases Greenacre. Well, in that case, right, Bobby had actual notice. The grantor literally told Bobby about the prior conveyance. So we'd say in that case, Bobby has actual notice, or he has personal knowledge of the prior interest. Record notice, right, is where a subsequent purchaser has record notice when any prior interest would be revealed by an appropriate search of the public records affecting land title. Record notice is really easy. Basically, any time a person properly records a deed, right, any time a person properly records a deed, so a grantee properly records a deed, from that moment in time forward, right, the whole world is on notice of that deed, right? All subsequent purchasers are now on notice. Whether or not those subsequent purchasers actually conduct a title search or not, whether or not they go through the public records and look for whether there's any prior interest or not, we don't care. It's only that had they done so, right, had they done an appropriate search of the public records, it would have revealed the prior interest. Right? So as long as the deed is properly recorded, from that point forward, all subsequent purchasers are on what we call record notice. Important to recognize if the deed is not properly recorded, right, and it would not have been revealed by an appropriate search of the public records affecting land title, then there's not record notice. We call that a wild deed, right? Some error is made in the recording process, right? Well, if that error would have made it such that the interest would not have been revealed by an appropriate search of the public records affecting land title, then we call it a wild deed. Subsequent purchasers are not on record notice. Finally, we have inquiry notice, right? A subsequent purchaser has inquiry notice when a reasonable investigation of the land would have revealed the existence of prior claims. So the most classic example of this would be when the initial grantee actually takes possession of the land, right? So let's say in our example that on Monday, our owner of Greenacre conveys fee simple absolute in Greenacre to Amy, and Amy takes possession of the land. She moves in, right? So she's actually living on the land. Well, subsequent purchasers, if they go and visit the land, right? They do a reasonable investigation. They knock on the door and they say, hey, you know, I hear this property is for sale. What's Amy going to say? You know, you mind if I take a look around? I want to see the property before I buy it. What's Amy going to tell that potential subsequent purchaser? What are you talking about? I live here. The land's not for sale, right? So if the initial purchaser, right, takes possession, at that point in time, subsequent purchasers are going to be on inquiry notice, right? Because if they do a reasonable investigation, they're going to learn, right, that this land is not actually for sale, right? They're going to learn that the, there is this existence of a prior claim, right? That's inquiry notice. And the most classic example of that is when our initial grantee actually takes possession of the land. Important to recognize, similar to record notice, it doesn't matter whether the subsequent purchaser actually conducted the investigation or not. Only that had they conducted a reasonable investigation, it would have revealed the existence of prior claims. Right? So it doesn't matter if they actually went and investigated or not, it's whether had they investigated, would it have revealed the existence of a prior claim. Right? But those are our three types of notice. Once we understand notice, 
we can start talking about the different recording act statutes in different jurisdictions, right? So essentially we have three types of recording act statutes that have been adopted by the states, right? And it's going to depend on what jurisdiction the state is. We have race jurisdiction states, notice jurisdiction states, and race notice jurisdiction states. By far, the majority are notice jurisdiction and race notice jurisdiction states, but we still have a few states that are race jurisdiction, right? So the easiest way to do this is just to work through examples, right? And we'll see, I've kind of built on each one so we can see how it plays out. All right, so let's look at the race jurisdiction states first, right? So if we have a race recording statute, the first purchaser for value to record prevails under a race statute, right? The first purchaser for value to record prevails, okay? So let's look at an example. Let's say that O conveys Green Acre to A, right? O conveys Green Acre to Amy. Let's say that that deed is not recorded at the time of the conveyance. But let's say time passes and B, Bobby, learns of the O to A transfer, right? This could be by a reasonable investigation. It could be by, right, um, some other actual notice, maybe the owner tells Bobby about the O to A transfer, maybe Amy tells Bobby, maybe he does an investigation, but one way or another, right, Bobby learns of the O to A transfer, right? Let's say then that after Bobby learns of the transfer to A, the O to A transfer, O, right, conveys Greenacre to Bobby, executes a valid deed, and Bobby records that deed. Right? And then let's say a few days later, Amy records her deed. Right? Well, in that case, right, Bobby's got a deed that says he holds rightful title to Green Acre, and Amy has a deed that says she holds rightful title to Green Acre. So if there's competing claims to title, who prevails, Bobby or Amy? Well, in this case, if it's a race jurisdiction, right, the first purchaser for value to record prevails. Well, let's say that Amy bought Green Acre for $100,000 and Bobby bought Green Acre for $200,000. So they're both purchasing for value, okay? So the first purchaser for value to record prevails. Well, who recorded first, right? Bobby recorded first, so Bobby wins. Race jurisdiction is pretty easy, right? The first purchaser for value to record prevails. Since Bobby was the first purchaser for value, he bought Green Acre for $200,000, and he was the first to record, Bobby prevails over Amy. Right, so race jurisdictions are really trying to emphasize, hey, you have to record, right? This is, the emphasis is putting on really trying to encourage recording of deeds, right? The first to record, because Bobby has notice, right? He has actual notice. Bobby learns of the O to A transfer. So here, Bobby actually has notice of the transfer from O to A, but, and then he purchases it anyways, even with notice of the prior conveyance. But because he records first, he wins, right? So in this case, Bobby would win. Important to recognize that had Bobby not purchased for value, let's say that our owner of Green Acre gifted to Bobby Green Acre, maybe Bobby is owner's son, right? So owner gifts Bobby. He donates Green Acre to Bobby in exchange for no consideration. In that case, Bobby would not prevail, right? Because he would not have been the first purchaser for value. Amy would have been the first purchaser for value to record. So Amy would win if Bobby had been given Green Acre for free as a gift. Okay, so it's always important to make sure that we do have a purchase for value, that Bobby is actually paying consideration in exchange for the interest, right? Okay, but we can move on to notice jurisdiction statutes next. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP, 
for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.